Hey, welcome to another session here at the Nonprofit Leadership Studio. Uh, thanks for joining us a little bit earlier. Uh, hey, we have uh, Sandy Wyckoff is with us today. She's the executive director at Urban Harvest, which is a very interesting organization. We'll get a chance to talk a little bit about that. We'll also get a chance to really listen in on leadership from Sandy's perspective. Sandy, welcome so much to the Thank studio you. here. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. Tell us, you know, when you're in an elevator, you know, the old elevator speech and you're going five floors with someone, what do you say about Urban Harvest when they say, oh, what's Urban Harvest? That sounds interesting. Okay, I say that Urban Harvest is a great nonprofit that was started about 20 years ago mm -hmm. by people who believe that growing your own food was the answer to health and sustainability of our resources and using organic practices would just be even better. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that has led to a lot of classes about organic gardening yeah. and sustainability. It's led to extensive school programming to teach kids about good nutrition and about how to grow food and where food comes from. It has led to one of the largest networks of community gardens in the country wow. that we help and you, support. And you do all the farmers markets too, right? Do you well, do, we do two primary farmers markets. We do the um, oldest and the best in the city that is on East Side Street every Saturday That's morning. Great yeah. It's great. We have about 70 vendors now. We wow. support about 40 local farms, 50 local businesses. Um, and it's it's a great time actually for those who haven't been there. There's it's breakfast. Wonderful. There's music. There's a lot of like-minded, health-minded, yeah. eco-minded people. You have a chance it's to talk fun. to the producers too about yeah. what are their practices. So if you want to buy eggs and you want to know, you know, what the chickens ate, you you have a chance to Do actually talk Saturday? to them. I go almost every Saturday unless yeah. I have a conflict. Yeah. I, I try and make it. I went long before I was at Urban Harvest right. as well, though. I'm, yeah. I'm a believer in it, and I think it's uh, it's great. I have it's friends terrific. who go there religiously. I mean, I, I think I go, you know, twice a month or something. Yeah. But uh, you get eggs, you know, and some fresh right. produce and some Indian food, you know. Yeah. And with Monica Pope still has scones, you want to get some of those, right? Yeah. But uh, it's, it's a wonderful thing. And what's very interesting now... It seems like while Urban Harvest was founded 20 years ago, it's always been relatively visible to certain people, but it's sort of trendy now, isn't it? Everything that Urban Harvest is about, it seems like it's it's coming to its own right now. Well, I think that its relevance has has become more in the forefront. Yeah. I mean, all of a sudden people are looking at processed foods. 20 years ago they weren't. It, it seems Urban Harvest was really a little bit ahead of its time. But we're thrilled about the fact that it's more relevant than ever. It, well, it's good news, bad news. Yeah. You know, you, you want people to eat so healthy that, you know, yeah. it's not necessary to keep promoting it. But, um, no, I agree with you. And there's also an environmental push, you know, yeah. eating seasonally, eating locally. It's very important. You the don't want the, that table. whole carbon footprint. You don't, yeah. don't want to buy fruit from around the world that was flown here. It's less mm -hmm. nutritious. It's, you know, it's uh, taking its toll on, yeah. on the environment. Now, you are sort of an unusual leader, right, in, in the sense of that you came from a, an arts organization and then you moved into sort of this agriculture-like organization. Mm -hmm. How was that transition as a leader for you? It was an interesting cultural change. Um, I really believe that running a nonprofit, though, is a transferable skill. Yeah. So there is a definitely. And that's a, what every student watching you believes. Is okay. Well. So that's good. So. Um, yeah, because I don't have extensive gardening background. Mm -hmm. I have been a foodie for a while. Mm -hmm. I am a believer in the mission. The most critical thing I believe is to believe in whatever mission. And if you're in nonprofit work, that is the core. It, mm -hmm. It's sort of everything will go back to the mission, mm -hmm. pretty much every aspect of management, every aspect of, of everyone's passion for it will go back to that. So mm -hmm. yes, there was a, definitely a change, but I also think going from a, even one arts nonprofit to another arts <laughs> nonprofit, there's probably some yeah, cultural I changes right that too. go along with that as well. Yeah, yeah. Tell me about your leadership style. One of the questions we often ask here is, you know, if you're writing a book on leadership, the mm -hmm. Sandy Wyckoff Guide to Great Nonprofit Leaders, what are some of the chapters, what are some of the important components of leadership for you? 
I think the most important thing is to try and inspire and empower the staff to do their very best and to rise to the occasion and being less in charge and, and more someone who who rallies everyone mm -hmm. and keeps up morale and, and certainly helps with direction. Uh, in an ideal world, every decision would, would gain consensus. It's not an ideal world, yeah. so you have to step up and make some decisions that may not make everyone happy. But, but really, um, everyone find their strengths and try and capitalize on them. Um, and in, you want people to do what they love doing. Mm -hmm. It's important to talk to everyone on the staff and find out sometimes there are hidden talents or hidden things they, they really want to do, and it may be a place to fill, you know, in yeah. the organization. Yeah. But I think it's, it's to get everyone to, to really buy in and to do their very best and to feel empowered to do their very best. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, how big is Urban Harvest right now? How many staff? We're do you 11 full-time, wow. and then we have contractors, of course, yeah. and a lot of volunteers. That's a big footprint for 11 people, isn't it? I mean, you have a, a, a pretty high visibility in the city. It's, it's, the programs are very broad. Yeah. Yes, we get an enormous amount done. Yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> it's good. It's a little daunting to, <laughs> to, to stop and think about it, yeah. Um, tell us about you, and where did you grow up, Sandy? Um, I grew up on Long Island in New really? York. Wow. Yes, and I moved when I was 13. My parents moved. Um, our family moved to Florida, and I uh -huh. went to high school and the University of Florida in Gainesville for college. Wow. And then I moved to Houston to go to law school. Mm -hmm. um, I actually thought I was going halfway to California, but I, <laughs> I stopped in Houston. Um, I developed roots here, and I really have loved it, and I've, wow. so I've spent my whole and adult life here. Did you get a law degree here as well? I did. I graduated oh, wow. from the University of Houston. Um, and law what was Center. your first job out of uh, law school? Um, I worked for a title company doing some land work, mm -hmm. and then I went into private practice, um, mm -hmm. doing a lot of probate, mental health, wow. little criminal. Yeah. And, and then the transition to nonprofit, where did that happen for you? You know, interestingly, I practiced law for about 10 years. Mm. Um, I had a family, and um, I know one of the questions you had written here yeah. was work-life balance. Yeah. And um, in particular- Do you have one? Do you have work For women, <laughs> I, I do. But you know, it is, it is challenging yeah. um, when, and so there were some, there were some interesting paths um, that came about. From, from family situations, whether it be illness or parents or children or a spouse or mm -hmm. all of those interesting things. And um, I really took a step back and thought about what I wanted to do and mm -hmm. I really wanted to work in nonprofit. I had always been drawn to social services mm -hmm. and even in law, that yeah. was the direction of things, a lot of mental health. And so it, it seemed like the right path, and so I, I made a change. Wow, and what was that first nonprofit? First, the first nonprofit was the, with AIDS Foundation Houston. Mm -hmm. So, and that was that was a while ago. It yeah. was a different disease then, but it yeah. was it was a very compelling job, and it it um, it was important work. And most recently, you were at the River, an arts organization, and you were there for many years. Yes, I was there for eight years. Yeah. So, it was extremely rewarding. Mm -hmm. it, it really was. It was um, pretty small when I got there, and it, it really, we saw exponential growth and impacted a lot of families, and um, it was a fabulous experience. We and then merged with Theater Under the Stars, yeah. and that was very, very interesting from a career perspective. Mm -hmm. um, it was a great learning atmosphere, and there are great people there. I, I learned a lot, and I think you just reach a point where you're looking for maybe yeah. a change. There was it was it hard to go from being the leader to not being the leader and just being in a leadership position but not being the CEO when you went to um, Theater Under the Stars? It was interesting. Um, I loved working there. Yeah. So not necessarily yeah. because the, the responsibilities broadened, mm. you know? And so there were some things so that, that were, yeah. I. Yeah. I I learned a lot. The the piece that was less so is the board relationships mm -hmm. that you have. So mm -hmm. you know that's that's clearly a change. 
Yeah. Tell me about uh, Urban Harvest and the board and your governance structure there. Well, it's interesting that you ask because mm -hmm. um, it's very important, I think, for every nonprofit to keep reassessing. Um, look at a strategic plan and sort of the environment keeps changing, yeah. literally, figuratively. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and to make sure that what you're doing is relevant and that applies to governance, it applies to staffing, it applies to programming. So there are actually, um, we're going through a strategic planning process right now. Last Saturday we had a retreat. So oh, wow. there is a lot of exciting, a lot of exciting things going on right now and sort of reassessing things mm -hmm. just because, um, you know, the only constant is change. So <laughs> <laughs> you got to keep up with it. How will that impact your board? Um, the board, well, they're, they're looking at that as well, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, they're breaking, we're looking at maybe do we need the same committees that we've had? Do we need new ones? Are there new things we need to be looking at? Mm -hmm. So there's certainly that. The board is very active. They're very engaged. They're very passionate. And that's pretty fabulous. Yeah. So many times when you talk to nonprofit leaders, they talk about different types of boards. You know, there's a fundraising board, there's working boards, there's the governing board. How would you sort of describe your board? Is it a big fundraising board? Uh, they help with fundraising and there is a very active development committee. Mm -hmm. um, I heard a great quote that I, I will repeat. It's, if you've seen one board, you've seen one board. <laughs> right, um, right. Because even if I say that, we can bring on two new people and it changes. Change, yeah. Or the officers change and all of a sudden, the whole structure changes. So it's boards really change pretty constantly. Yeah. And all those aspects are very important though. You mm -hmm. know, fundraising is a key component for every board and for every nonprofit and for the staff and for everyone. It's, mm -hmm. it's just, um, that's the reality of being in nonprofit work is that yeah. it's, it's just something that has to be looked at and nurtured all the time. Yeah. How many board members? Do Right now we have 15. About 15. Oh, that's a good size, yeah. It is a good size. And I, I understand that the trend is lower, is around that, that it had yeah. been higher. Um, but that's my understanding, yeah. is, again, that, is that it's board, trending. <laughs> that's absolutely right. There are boards that have 75 people yeah, on it. I know, them. I know. And, you know, uh, Ronnie Haggerty has sat in, this, sat in this chair from the United Way, and she often talks about the ones you've seen one board, you've seen one board. That's she, so, I was quoting her. Yeah. <laughs> she facilitated. And so she's always talking about smaller boards, smaller boards. And, but some organizations, I mean, Children at Risk, we have 40 board members, you know, and it, it's worked just fine. We even did a big reevaluation re when we thought the trend should be smaller, and we decided, well, it actually works pretty well. So if it's, it's working, it's, yeah. you know. Now, if it doesn't work, you need to change, right? But Ronnie, I'm a, I'm a big fan of Ronnie's. As am I. Yeah. yeah, she is, um, she's extraordinary. And actually that, that quote was from her. So yeah. it was, <laughs> but it has stuck with me and I've used it because I'm um, partake in aspects of the United Way. Um, they offer leadership circles that are really right. wonderful opportunities yeah. for executive directors because you, you have the board, you have the staff, um, and you don't really talk about one to the other too much, mm -hmm. you know, so it's, it's a great opportunity and it's a fabulous resource. Yeah. Yeah. I love those leadership circles. It's, but it's personnel and board seems to be the big, the, those are always the big topics. I think, uh, you've seen a lot of nonprofits, Sandy, when you look at the sort of the scheme of nonprofits, the landscape of nonprofits in front of you. Do you often see nonprofits and you say, oh, they could be doing a better job? I mean, do you often uh, think about your talents and, and how other nonprofits could be doing much better? Um, it's hard to assess. Yeah. It's hard to assess. The one thing I know is you never really know what's happening. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of moving parts in a nonprofit mm -hmm. um, between the staff and the board, and then their are community partners. Um, what funding sources they have or don't have or are worried about not having. Um, yeah. So it's very hard to make an assessment without having the facts and I hesitate. Um, yeah. I think a lot of a lot of nonprofits, we all struggle with the same things, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. volunteers, how to manage volunteers or, yeah. you know, is just one example. But I tend not to draw conclusions without a lot of facts. <laughs> <laughs> So. Oh, I draw those conclusions uh, you right do? and you left. Do. <laughs> I do. So what's the most exciting part of being at Urban Harvest for you? 
Well, you know, I've been there a year and a half, um, and I, you need to go through, I believe, at least one year, one mm -hmm. full cycle mm -hmm. to sort of understand mm -hmm. any nonprofit, just, yep. just because the ebbs and the flows, and people say that's a busy time of year, but you don't really know it until you live it and, and whatnot. So one of the things that's exciting is that I feel like I have that under my belt. Not that I know everything by any means, <laughs> but just that I do have a sense so that I, I feel like I can take part in some sort of strategic thinking with an idea of how the programs flow and work together. Mm -hmm. Very good. One of the, the, the advanced class had a l number of questions about marketing. Tell me about, you know, how do you guys sort of work your name brand? I mean, how is it that Urban Harvest is so well known? And what are you guys doing to let people know about Urban Harvest? That's a great question, um, and and marketing is is a very interesting um, animal, mm -hmm. and I, I will call it that. Um, partly because social media has come in, mm -hmm. and it keeps changing. And I thought it was my imagination, but I I've talked to people from Google. I've talked to people yeah. you know who do this for a living. Um, and they say, no, they keep changing it. Mm -hmm. So do you buy an ad on Facebook? Do you not buy an ad on Facebook? Yeah. How you promote one thing over another? And one of the challenges with marketing is the various demographics. Mm -hmm. You know, there is the demographic that has a very high giving capacity who really likes things in paper and likes to get things in the mail. There are those who only read email. You know, right. each I've, I've heard all the breakdowns of the demographics. Um, Urban Harvest is fortunate. We've been around for 20 years and there is great name recognition. Yeah. And we're really working now to make sure that people know what we offer. You know, the farmer's market mm -hmm. is probably the most visible of the programs, but the community garden program and the classes and the school programs, we won a statewide award for wow. the school programs. You know, we just got a Mayor's Proud Partner Award. We just picked it up on Monday, you know, wow. for our work in food deserts. Mm -hmm. So. It's, that's the challenge with marketing, is how to get people to really know what you do. We have um, what has become a very successful weekly electronic newsletter mm. that has a far reach. Um, historically, it was geared towards different segments, and we put it all under one banner, and it has really helped with getting um, volunteers and sort of cross-promoting the programs wow, yeah. and making it a little more cohesive. But we are looking at it. We're looking at the different audiences that we have and going and looking at um, really sort of what's out there in the environment. And it's a challenge. I think marketing is more of a challenge now than it has been in the past because there are so many channels. Yeah. We see nonprofits thinking about uh, marketing in very active ways that we maybe never did before, right? You know, how are we going to get our name out? Do you guys have sort of a committee or a board committee or a group internally that spend time looking at marketing, especially right now? It's a right newly now? formed committee. Oh, wow. <laughs> very good. And it's very exciting yeah. because we're looking at trends. We're looking at audiences. We're, we're looking at all of that. We do actively promote on social media. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are things going on, but I think the role is really to see, can we be doing this better? Are there groups we could be marketing too. We have a fruit tree sale that's the biggest oh, yeah. in the region coming up on January yeah, 17th. That's a I'll big get a deal. plug in in yeah, case anyone. Yeah. But you know, all of a sudden the conversation is do you do you contact builders of homes? You know what I mean is mm -hmm. a marketing channel that you may not think about it mm -hmm. as opposed to simply getting spots on the radio or your traditional media outlets. Mm -hmm. How big is your mailing list about? Do you know off the top of your head? Your email list? The email list was at about 10,000. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, you have to try and clean that up too. <laughs> I know. The, you never the, know the, what the real number is, do you? you our know? open rate is pretty good. I mean, um, I think it's in the mid 20s. You know, it fluctuates. It's very good. It's very good. Yeah. All this stuff, it's, it's a constant change, though. Um, yeah. I have to say that that area. And I've had it confirmed by people half my age. So I feel very confident saying it is just in a constant state of change about sort of what to do and all of the above. And when do you use Twitter? You know, Twitter is is great for like the fruit tree sale. Yeah. Very, very active. People want to know people what's, what's sold out, out and, yeah. and retweet at the market yeah. as well. 
is it an everyday thing? Not no. really. You know, maybe maybe with more resources, and that's something to look at. Mm -hmm. Is that something? Where do you have your? Do you tweet your big, yourself? I do not. You don't. Yeah. I do not. Yeah. Do you? I do, I do, but not enough. I mean, this is what people. <laughs> I, I have lots of people who follow me, and I feel like I'm letting them down when I oh. don't tweet enough. You know. <laughs> Because I'm like, you know, once a week, it's a good New York Times article about something around children's right. policy. and so. But it's good. I mean, it's I'm on glad. my list of things to do. I do I'll post yeah. on Facebook, and I do that. Oh, that's I mean, good. But we do have others, you know, who do tweet. But, yeah. but it's, it's on my list, so I'll, I'll take that. You yeah. Know. Do you guys have, a, we have a, a rule of thumb that we talk about in terms of email marketing that we should only send a certain number of emails a week because... You know, if you were to ask someone who's on the email list for children at risk, they would say, I think I get something every day. When, when indeed, we probably send, you know, maybe two a week max. Do you have some sort of rules like that that you know of? The email, the, the big blast, yeah. um, is once a week with our, our newsletter, and we have used it sparingly on mm -hmm. other occasions. Ah, okay. You know, so once a week is really what Once a week, and then... On occasion, whether it's for an appeal or we have an event coming up on November 9th that we're we're going to use it for, um, just to get the word out. But but pretty sparingly. Yeah. It it's hard to know. It is hard to know, and our people are very rigid about these things. We sometimes wonder about this, but they're like, no, we can't do more than three. This is it, you know. And so, it's it's. Uh, but they say people will start unsubscribing, so it's oh, sort of an interesting. Oh yeah, but it, you know, interestingly, too, staff-wise, monitoring all this is, you know, we obviously we don't have a dedicated person, but but it it's really become a job that didn't even used to exist to figure out what the open rate is and what, what are the Google Analytics and really bring that to right. the staff meeting and let us know what's working and what's not. So it's it's a whole area that sort of didn't used to exist and yeah. it's, it's, it is changing all the time. There's a couple questions. One of the questions, uh, Nicole wanted to know, do you have a marketing budget? I mean, an organization your size, do, do you actually allocate specifically for marketing? We have, it's small. And, mm -hmm. and we're actually, it's one of the things we are looking at. It, it's not a big budget, but we do have some. We have printed materials and we need signage. And we, you know yeah. what I mean? There are some basics. We yeah. have outreach events and so that. It's, um, with social media, you, you know, it's less of a budget. Yeah. I mean, some of it gets just hidden in the costs of the overhead for that. So there is, actually, I take it back, the newsletter would have yeah, I there, guess so. there's a cost associated with that, but it's it's relatively small. But yes, absolutely, we have to have some money allocated for it. One of our social media people is a Vista AmeriCorps. Oh, that, that, you, that you works. Get for free, which right. is really a nice thing, right? Staff person, so yeah, um, that's so helpful. That do you have Vistas on your staff? We do, do you? not. Yeah. You need to look into that. I will look yeah. into that. Well, free people is always good. Oh, so, I know. So, so Martha had this question, which I thought was interesting. She said, often marketing by nonprofits is looked down upon. Do you d agree or disagree? I sort of think that's changing. I'm, I'm, uh, and Because we, we do a lot of promotion these days, right? Well, um, you know, I'm not sure what marketing is being interpreted yeah. as. You know, ideally... Um, you get an article written about some wonderful program you did and get credit and that's that's sort that's of marketing, marketing. <laughs> that that's that's the best marketing yeah. but i mean i think everyone has a website everyone mm -hmm. does everything they can to drive everyone to a website so i i don't know that i agree with that i'm not sure what type of marketing yeah it yeah. is being referred to, but I, I don't think of it as a negative. Yeah. I think it's it's wonderful. Most nonprofits, they just do wonderful work, and you want them to get credit, and you really want people to benefit from the services they offer. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a great thing, actually. Harry had a question about uh, the brand, creating the brand. Now, you inherited a great brand. I inherited Do you guys brand. talk about that, about how you sort of... Uh, coordinate your branding or, or we are yeah. we are um, those conversations have always happened they're happening more intensely now mm -hmm. um, as part of this strategic plan and it's very exciting because well, as I said I, I hate to repeat myself but it's, it's okay. you've got to revisit this all the time mm -hmm. um, you know new people come in the space or, or there's some change 
that yeah. goes on. You know, it, it's not the same environment it was 20 years ago. So One of the things as we talk about marketing and branding and creating visibility, um, a lot of times nonprofits, especially so a nonprofit that's sort of Houston based or Texas based, they'll compare themselves, you know, they'll know who their national look-alike partners are, you know, who's the, who is the Urban Harvest in New York or who's the National Urban Harvest? When you think about organizations that are like you around the country, who are some of the, you know, I think of the Food Trust out of Philadelphia that mm -hmm. was much like Urban Harvest but has now become more national in scope. I mean, are those aspirations that you have and who are some of the other groups that you look at? Um, we do look around the country. I think one of the things that makes Urban Harvest unique is is that it it's scope. Mm -hmm. They're generally more community gardens or focused on schools or focused on classes and it's it's the broadness. Yeah. So we do look at best practices of course and get some ideas and certainly farmers markets where we all scout the farmers market yeah. like every personal vacation is like <laughs> I'll never go to a farmers market and look at it the same now. There's now, some good ones around the country <laughs> man I'm telling you. Or I'll, yes especially out of the country there yeah. are some good ones yeah. too and, and we can't compare ourselves to California yeah. we have to tell ourselves that because yeah. our farmers market is, uh, covers a 180 mile radius so you know. Yeah and really we are in a sense, when you look at, uh, I lived in Amherst, Massachusetts for a little while, and a great farmer's market downtown for a very little town. But Massachusetts and New England and some of the Northeast states and California, they have a culture of having, even Pennsylvania, the culture right. of having food markets and farmers type markets. For Houston, I mean, when I moved here in the in the 80s, there was no farmer's market, right? It was. Uh, there was a little a little garden market up on airline, right? But there wasn't really what, what we would normally call a farmer's market like the east side market. The east side market's 10 years old. Yeah. So, and it took, my understanding is it, it took quite a while to grow. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of the, the granddaddy. I've, yeah. I've read that. And there are a lot of little it, ones starting at the same time. And they've all come together. Yeah. There are a lot of, of small markets or market stands and... Um, going on. Mm -hmm. Our focus is primarily east side and then we also have a partnership with the city of Houston. The and downtown that's for, one? Yes, the oh, downtown nice one, one at City Hall. We'll move back to City Hall. We're at the library right now because okay. City Hall, the pond is under construction, but okay. we're moving back in November. Um, and that's seasonal. Mm -hmm. And But that has been, this is the ninth season. So um, that's been a terrific partnership. We love wow. working with the city. People love that market too. I've never been to that market downtown. And I visit with city council members, but I've never been there on a market day. So it's, oh, it's terrific. If yeah. you're down there on a Wednesday, it's yeah. Wednesday from 11 to 1.30. Yeah. So. And, and the, apparently people go and have lunch because the food is fantastic. Yes, the food is great. Um, it, it's terrific. Yeah. It, it, there's less fresh produce, mm -hmm. you know, and more prepared food mm -hmm. and some other things. But, but the... We've understood that people are going back to offices, so they may shop a little, but but not quite as much as a destination shopping. But it's it's really gotten very very popular. Wow, very good. So let me ask a couple. Amy, I uh, wanted to know, uh, in starting your career and attending law school, did you think during college at at Florida? I went to Florida State, by the way. So, oh, really? So oh. at Florida. <laughs> Uh, and then law school at U of H. Did you ever think that maybe you might end up in the nonprofit world? Um, honestly, no. Yeah. I, I didn't during college. Um, I was a psychology major. <laughs> so, and I, I looked at, at the graduate school. And um, when I went to law school, it was a very popular decision or it was considered a great gateway to either practicing law mm. or, or doing something. I knew it was a great yeah. education, and, and it is a great education. Yeah. Um, it's changed a little now. Um, yeah. I have a 25-year-old son who had wanted to go to law school, and the numbers were very upside down when he was making that decision a few years ago. Yeah. So it's, um, I'm acutely aware of, of what has happened there, but it was, um, it's a great education. It has come in very, very handy. Not necessarily practicing, but almost every day. There's there's something, yeah. there's a contract, or yeah. there's dealing with 
lawyers, and so I've always been very comfortable with that and, mm -hmm. and enjoyed that part of it, mm -hmm. whether it's, it's HR or, as I said, contract or, you know, is an employee an employee or a contractor, all of that. I, I like the law, so it's, um, it, it's been an asset for me. Yeah. Well, I, love, I have uh, four lawyers on my staff. And really? I co-teach this with uh, a lawyer as well. So, uh, Well, there's yeah. no shortage of lawyers who don't practice <laughs> law, actually. <laughs> so Mandy Lovett wanted, this is an interesting question. In terms of technologies that Urban Harvest has adopted that have had a significant change in your operations, how has technology helped outside of social media? Uh, is technology something that you guys use at Urban Harvest? We are in the process of, of trying to add, mm -hmm. um, whether it be a webinar or what. We, we're doing a lot of research about that, mm -hmm. about how best to offer um, classes. Um, it has certainly helped with the website. We are able to offer resources on the website. Um, and Facebook, we have like a, a closed group. Mm -hmm. um, people are welcome to join, but it, but it is closed where people ask gardening questions. It's fairly new and it already has like 150 people and it's growing all the time. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's great interest for that sort of interaction. You know, take a picture, show it and say, what do I do with this? Or oh, how wow. do I do this? And so it has really helped with sharing. Um, it's helped with <laughs> This is going to sound, but those little four squares, that, that has helped because people <laughs> buy memberships and they buy classes oh, and at okay. the food tree sale. So that sort of technology, we have iPads. So it's, it's helpful in that regard. But we are really, really excited about looking at, at offering certain classes online um, Your or, audience. or doing something like that. I should probably talk to you about how you, <laughs> how you do this exactly, yeah. although this, this studio seems um, a little far reaching for us, <laughs> but, but really looking at how can we reach, because the, the mission is to, to really spread the education, mm -hmm. to get everyone to grow and not be intimidated and you know, it doesn't matter if you're a beginner. And if you don't want to grow, then at least buy something that someone around yeah. here has grown. But, so. And then your audience just gets so much bigger Absolutely. so quickly with this because this is stuff that people are very interested in. Yes. Yeah, very nice. Uh, Esmeralda wanted to know about um, as you do your strategic planning and you plan for an increase in your budget, you know, as you look at development, where do you guys look for expansion at Urban Harvest? I mean, when you think about how do you expand that budget, what do you, th what do you think about? Well, the traditional ways to expand are going to be either through individuals or corporations or foundations or events. Mm -hmm. um, in an ideal world, we would look at that pie chart and expand individuals. Right. And I think most organizations are in that same right. position. That, that seems to be what everybody preaches. Um, and so we're looking at really all of the above, though, mm -hmm. you know, where the interest lies, where the partnerships may lie, um, and, and sort of going at it that way. But it's sort of all of the above with fundraising, you know? <laughs> yeah. So Latrina Dorsey wants to know about managing staff. Um, you know, how much do you manage? What do you do around conflict? Is this something that you that that is part of your everyday job or personnel management? If you want to run a nonprofit, um, is a big part of the job, and just setting the tone. Um, I mean, it's it's best to lead by example and try and stay calm and mm -hmm. and be respectful of others mm -hmm. and uh, be as transparent as is appropriate. Um, and we have staff meetings once a week to sort of come together. Um, everybody's busy and out doing programs a lot. It's not an office where everybody's there all the time. So it's a really good time to sort of let people say what's going on, if they need anything, make sure everyone feels supported. Um, I tend not to be a heavy handed. Mm -hmm. um, I, I really love for the staff to bring their expertise and, and really work toward what we want to work toward together as a team. Um, so, but I think it, it's important 
for them to understand there is someone with an eye on on the bigger picture and yeah. the leader and communicating with the board and an understanding that we are all in this mission together and we're all moving in the same direction. Is your staff, are you, do you have a lot of generalists or are they sort of specialists, you know, in community gardens and specialists in uh, They're markets? mostly program specialists. Yeah. They're mostly, and then um, generalists, I mean, somebody who works with the database and, yeah. you know, that. And we try and cross, create as much cross training as possible. And a lot of them um, really have great expertise with mm -hmm. gardening and building gardens. But and of your different areas, is there one that foundations tend to like to fund more than others? I mean, is there, I mean, for instance, in our work, uh, we know that foundations like to fund public education programs, yet some of our human trafficking work, our child trafficking work, seems to get more attention, not more funding, but more attention. Do you have any sort of interesting things like that? I mean, I think the school programs um, mm -hmm. are always very compelling. Mm -hmm. I, I think whatever whatever you're doing with kids, well, you, yeah. I mean, you, your yeah. kids and then all the subcategories. Right. But our school programs get a lot of attention because it also expands to the family. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you teach the kids, the kids bring it home. If you teach the whole family about nutrition and how to grow, you know, parents become interested in what their kids are interested in. And mm -hmm. so that I, I think is really critically important. And, and also from a funding standpoint, it, it's, um, it's very compelling. Mm -hmm. I think all the programs are compelling, but that probably is the most. Yeah. Aruna Davies wants to know, uh, outside of the board, do you have a lot of volunteers that work for Urban Harvest, and how do you motivate them? Well, we do have a lot. Um, most people will come to us. Mm -hmm. So the motivation, you know, is you just have to make sure with volunteers that you manage expectations as to what it is they will be doing um, and how often and, and all of that. But we have a lot of volunteers that come. We have a lot of groups. We have a lot of individuals. Um, yeah. And are they one-time volunteers? You have, do you have some one-time and then you have it some long-terms? It varies. There are, there are groups that come back. And, um, you know, it's also become very popular for businesses yeah. to have you know, we want to do something, and so we um, we place them a lot of times in gardens and, and have projects, you know, or with schools. Um. So do you have a volunteer coordinator on staff? No, you we do not. We have a few different people who manage the volunteers for their programs. Mm -hmm. So, okay. and that's another area actually we're looking at yeah. in terms of you know, there's a tendency for organizations, you start doing something a certain way and you grow right. and it keeps being done the same way. Yeah. And so we're, we're taking a look at some things, at some processes, you know. Um, and, and that's so smart to be able to do that. I mean, the whole idea of strategic planning and thinking about doing it in different ways, I mean, it's something that a new leader can often do. Uh, it's not always welcome, right? Because people sometimes like the same old thing. But, uh, but you, have, you know, boards generally like the idea, how do we be more efficient? How do we change things generally? Uh, there was a volunteer um, who managed a lot of the volunteer groups who was no longer able to volunteer. And so it's a great opportunity to go in and say, how was this done? Is, what are our resources right now? What has changed? We now have this group over here, like we have U of H students through their Bonner program who mm -hmm. help us. Mm -hmm. um, you know, our resources have changed and technology has changed. And so it's, it's actually been a great opportunity to sort of look at the processes and say, you know, is this yeah. efficient? Is this better? Are the needs the same? Yeah. I mean, a lot of the volunteer, you've had Ronnie here. Ronnie talks about how mm -hmm. volunteers have changed. Yeah. You know, it, it's not like it used to be. You don't get the same people who can come every week for X number of hours. Right. And especially if you're attracting younger groups, they may want to, it may be a one-time thing. It may be a community service thing. It mm -hmm. could be. So, I mean, it's, it's another area. Again, I'm repeating myself, <laughs> That's okay. but, but it's true. You know, it, it's another area that's changing. In fact, when, when she spoke to us about it, um, 
it was interesting to hear because, you know, as a nonprofit, you see the change in your own and you're sort of cognizant of it, mm. but then you realize it's part of a much bigger trend and it, it, you address it a little differently. Yeah, yeah. You know? The food bank seems to do a great job with volunteers. I don't know if you've ever been out there. They, I've been out there and, and we work with them. Um, they help us with nutrition programs mm -hmm. and so, um, they do. That place is huge. They host yeah. a lot of things. It's extraordinary. It's uh, my buddy Brian Green, and uh, he uh, he loves to talk about how he has more volunteers now than the Houston Rodeo, which is isn't that an amazing thing? That is amazing. Yeah, he has more volunteers than any other nonprofit now. But you know, they have a whole process for how, and volunteers have to pay. Like if if a business wants to come do a thing, they have to pay to be part of that. So, uh, is that right? Yeah, isn't that something? That's very interesting. It is. Well, I know, I know statistically, volunteers are, are very likely to want to donate. Mm -hmm. You know, if they give of their time, odds are it may not be a lot of money, mm -hmm. but, but it will be something because they clearly believe in the organization. Yeah. But that's, that's very interesting. So if Chevron wants to have a volunteer day at the food bank, they're expected to... Uh, that's sort of, interesting. Yeah, it is. And, and it makes sense, too. And you can see how Chevron would do that, right? Yes. So, yeah. Yes. It is, and, and I'm 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 ashamed I didn't think of it, but uh, oh no, you know. <laughs> no, Brian. So no, Brian also teaches a class here. So, oh, he yeah, does. Yeah, he does. Okay. So, oh, that's fascinating. Yeah, he's a very popular professor. So, almost as popular as I am, I think. I'm not sure. Oh, okay. What's uh, what is Elizabeth? I, I Iparea wants to know what is the biggest accomplishment that you've made as a leader. Uh, in your time as a nonprofit leader, what would you say is your biggest accomplishment? That's such an interesting question. Yeah, it is, isn't it? I love asking these questions because for so many of them, I couldn't answer them. So it's it's good that I get to ask them. Um, you know, the the river was a, a big part of my life, and I want to see it go on and on and on and grow, and. We developed a great relationship with Theater Under the Stars that then led to a merger because we all shared this vision that mm -hmm. it could make it so much bigger. Mm -hmm. And in many ways, it has. Mm -hmm. And um, it, I consider it a great accomplishment. And I must say, last week, the River Troop, the, the kids, the troop that, that started while I was there, we said we need some, a group to go on the road you know, and perform. They performed at the farmer's market and for Disability Awareness Month, and it, they, this is the second year they've done that. Mm -hmm. So for me personally, it was a high to see that crossing over and yeah. then see this great reception at the farmer's market. So I have to say, um, that was a high. Absolutely. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it was an interesting crossroads, and I'm, I'm thrilled about it. Um. Do most, uh, Sharonda wants to know about uh, your sponsors, Whole Foods and Chase. Um, do, do some of these places like Whole Foods, do they come to you first? I think I know the answer. Or do Whole you... Foods is actually, we have, um, that relationship was in place. We've, we certainly work with them, but um, they have taken a great interest in the garden, and we've had the second annual um, Whole Foods Kids Market Day. So that relationship is, is becoming broader because it's not just them giving money. Mm -hmm. They come and volunteer. We set up in their parking lot. There were oh. 10 schools before. I believe it's, I, I should have the date, but I think it's November. Um, I'm sorry, That's I don't okay. have the date. It's, it's just yeah, a, yeah. it's a whirlwind in there. <laughs> I I but I got here on the right night, so th that's an <laughs> that's accomplishment. Good, and early too. And yeah. there's construction, so yeah. there you go. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that relationship, um, they took an interest, I'm not 100% sure how it started. It was in place, but it has grown. Mm -hmm. They recently, um, they helped support our initiative in Sunnyside, which is, um, we have a couple community gardens there in, in a food desert to try and increase access to nutritious food and teach people how to grow. And Whole Foods has helped support, but they also come out with volunteers. Mm -hmm. They were out at, at our recent build, um, which was fabulous. That's nice, yeah. So ideally the relationships are more than just money. 
if, if you can engage the volunteers, uh, most of the places are, are looking for that. To, mm -hmm. they, want, they want a partnership. Absolutely. They don't want to just, you know, yeah. give money. And to stick with the spirit of Sharonda's question, I would guess for us, maybe for every 20 corporate or foundation visits that we make, that maybe one has come to us first, out of, one out of 20. I mean, what, would, would there be an average like that for you, or do you, would you know? You know, it's, it's hard for me to say yeah. that in a year and a half. Yeah. Um, we have been approached. Yeah. I, I can tell it's you It's nice that. when you get that. I mean, oh, you get it's, very it's excited. fabulous. They want us. How, how did this happen? We didn't have to ask them first. Uh, I mean, so I have seen it happen. I, I'm, I just don't feel like yeah. I have the, yeah. the longevity to be able to sort of say it statistically. But we have been found. We've had foundations find us. We, and... Show I guess up, the, the, the more visible had, you are, the better, right? The more that. visible, and I, I really think the website um, mm -hmm. is critical that it, that it tells your story. We and, have and people who find it. And you guys have such a unique mission it. too. I think. It, yeah, I, I mean, it depends if if people are looking around. Um, that's another thing with marketing, though. Like you, you learn things about you know how people can find you on Google. We were advised to shorten our statement because. Really? What yes to uh, <laughs> to 175 characters because oh. when you do a Google search that's what shows up, oh. and so you don't want to kill it with starting with Urban Harvest is a nonprofit, right. okay? Because they've 501c3, yeah, right? Exactly. It's like wait a minute, don't kill all those yeah, characters yeah, yeah, with yeah, that, yeah. you know? Which was an interesting thing oh, to yes. learn. It may change next month, but for yeah. right now, I, I think it's still valid. And when you Google Urban, is Urban Harvest one of the first things that? Uh, probably Urban uh, Outfitters probably comes up first, but I would, I don't know. Just because got, I have a daughter, I, I know these, you know, Urban uh -huh. Outfitters. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so, in, Brittany Kilgore wants to know about your, your the, the Urban Harvest budget. Uh, have you been successful in the last year in raising more than the previous year? I mean, have you? Yeah. So. The budget's about a million, mm -hmm. a little over, but, but that ballpark. Yeah. Now, there was a CEO for Urban Harvest. Was it the founder? Was Bob the, before that? Bob was... Randall. Um, he's a bit of an icon. Yeah, you right. Know? He is. Yeah, he's he's a fantastic guy. He's still involved. He's on the advisory was board. Was he one of the founders, or he, he was, just was one of the founders? Okay. Um, there was a you know a small group of people who got together, but he was the founding executive director, and he was the ED for. I believe 12 years oh, or wow. 12 or 14 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he left in 2008. So wherever that puts it. And was so there someone years. in between? Were there, were there many people in between you and Bob? Um, or just one person? Two. Two in between, yeah. And that's not unusual that when you have sort of big personality founder or someone who's been around right. for a while, that the next person isn't as successful because people, it's, it goes back to that change, right? It's a change that's very common, especially yeah. with a founder. Um, yeah. You know, I, I think there's there's even like a founder's syndrome, you know, and it it's it is. It goes back to change. It goes back to um, goes back to all of those all of those things. Yeah. yeah. But it, but it can definitely successfully transition, you know. And I think it all depends on the personality and and who who the players are. Yeah. Uh, let me do one more question, and then we'll do some fun questions. Um, online giving, Sandra Helsher wants to know, do you have much online giving? Do you know? We're working on it. <laughs> <laughs> We're working on it. I, I mean, there's some in, in response to some of the appeals we've done. Um, as just a general, G, they just went on our website and gave. We have not had that as much. Mm -hmm. We would love to get to that place. Mm-hmm as opposed to it being in response to an appeal. You know, sometimes people get something in the mail and then they go online and give, you know. Okay, here's two good questions. Spencer, okay. Quick, Spencer wants to know, uh, uh, aquaponics, hydroponics, you guys doing any of that sort of stuff? We have had people at the market, yes. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah. We're not doing it, no, but we have vendors. Yeah, yeah absolutely. absolutely. And Ebu uh, Aswaru wants to know, uh, have you ever partnered with WIC? To, to be able to use WIC, uh, food stamps. We're working on it. Yeah. We're working Can on it. Can you use food stamps in the farmer's market right now? No. 
No, uh, but we're snap is it snap, properly called? Snap. Yeah. No, I I know I know. <laughs> um, no, but we are actively moving toward that. Because many places do, many states have done that, right? Is are, are many f uh, farmers markets in Texas doing the? Uh, I snap? I know that some in Austin are doing oh, it. So they, I'm can, not. Yeah. But but we are. Yeah, there have been some conference calls lately and some information lately, and it's something that we very much want to yeah. make happen. Which would be a good thing, though it would be farmer's a good market's thing. not necessarily cheaper than going to a grocery store, but I guess it depends what you're doing, right? What you you're know, it, it does depend. I mean, the produce, um, that's another changing area, though. You yeah. know, I mean, the grocery stores didn't used to feature organic. Right. And now they all do. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's interesting, which is wonderful. Mm -hmm. I would like it to be cheaper there. I would like it to be accessible to everyone. It, it's better for your health. It's better for everything. It you just, know? it tastes really better. Sandy, it tastes so much better. Well, you know, one thing is that the market, you know, a lot of the chefs are there. You don't know they're chefs. They're mm -hmm. not wearing t-shirts that say, I'm a chef who works for yeah. a restaurant you've heard of, but, but they shop there. And I, I mean, I've found it too. If I cook with it, 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 everything tastes better. It makes life a little easier, you know? You don't have to do so much yeah. to it. You know, we, we, we've spent time in Italy where the whole country basically is all organic. No one does anything but. And it's amazing how every dish you try just tastes so much better. And Yeah, anyway. no, it's, um, it's, it's exciting that people are really getting it, yeah. you know, um, that it, it is so relevant and that, that people really are starting to care about their health more and what they eat and whether or not it has chemicals or doesn't. And um, it's so important. So, I, I mean, it, it's wonderful yeah, that, yeah. It, that it's grown like this. Ideally, that, that's our mission is we want everybody to, you know, have access to local, ex nutritious food. And yeah. so, you know, I'm telling you, either grow it or buy it. So. <laughs> but do one or the other. Final question. Sure. Uh, uh, one is, do you have a favorite restaurant in town? I'm going to say Underbelly. Oh, um, yeah. I love it there. And um, they're also hosting a fundraiser for us on November 9th. No wonder you love it. I uh, love but I loved it though. before. I loved it before. <laughs> but I, I have to say, I have to say that. And Chris Shepard is, is terrific. And they really emphasize seasonal local yeah, food. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the reason, I mean, it, it's such a, a wonderful fundraiser. It's for the 10th anniversary, and it's really a celebration of local food. Mm -hmm. So we're actually pairing farmers and chefs, which oh, we nice. haven't done before. Yes, um, working together. So there'll be about eight stations, mm -hmm. and they're going to come up with all wonderful Very dishes nice. that's all fresh and delicious. Wow. We did a fundraiser, I think it was two weekends ago, where we had chefs come to do brunch based upon the the budget that the U.S. Department of Agriculture gives you for oh, school breakfast. Oh, yes. Oh, okay. And Michael Cordua from uh, uh, America's, Michael yes. and David Cordua, and Uchi was, I mean, a lot of great restaurants right. participated. Very fun and delicious. So you have to, it's hard to beat it's, that. Right? It's challenging. Yeah, no, it is. Yeah. And, and I, I love the fact that people are interested in yeah. that. It, it's wonderful. Uh, final question. When they do the Sandy Wyckoff story in Hollywood, oh, gosh. I which, which actress is going to play you? <laughs> so you need to give me a good answer on this one, Sandy. All right, I'll say Meryl Streep. Meryl Streep. What else am She's I like going to say? She's like the go-to for anyone. I, I know. Yeah, I know. Yeah, very good. Sandy, thank you for all the work that you're doing at Urban thank Harvest. You. And thank you for being a great leader and being thank a part you. of Houston. And thanks for coming to the class. Thanks very, very much for, for this opportunity. Absolutely. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you okay. so much. Thank you. We'll see you guys next time right here in the Nonprofit Leadership Studio. Take care.